permission was granted for the transfer of the franchise to Baltimore. Mr. Will Harridge, on the right, announced it to Mayor Delizandro and Mr. Marnum. And that's the way the story began. Let's see what happened next. That opening day, uh, you know, I remember it very well because that was a game that I pitched and uh, played against the Chicago White Sox and pitched nine innings and beat the White Sox three to one. The Oriole pitching it. tradition started, I believe, when we, we traded for, uh, for Mike Cuellar um, in 1969 or actually in the winter of 1968. My and job as a third trade. hitter was to get on base no matter what to put the game in the fourth hitter's hand. And if you put the, the game in the fourth hitter's hand, who was Eddie Murray, game was over. The Orioles made the trade to, to get uh, Frank Robinson, who was uh, 30 years old and truly uh, the greatest player I ever played with and one of the greatest players in the history and of the game. Whenever and, I say uh, the name of Doug DeSensei, I recall the day that we retired Brooks Robinson. And Doug was the player representative, and it was his duty to come out and say a few words uh, on behalf of the ball club for Brooks and his retirement. And as I introduced him, and he got a great welcome and came charging out, he one of, what, 42 different guys that have played third base for the club since Brooks. He got a nice ovation as he came. He came out out of the dugout, and he stopped when he got to third base, reached down and pulled the bag right out of the ground, and then jogged out to where the ceremony was, the second base, and handed it to Brooks and never had to say a word. That's the way it was. If we had four hits, boy, you were going by him, going over, come on now, get another base hit. Don't give up this out. Go out there and get a base hit. He didn't want you to give up that out. And uh, what Earl was, I like to describe Earl as he was the most impatient, patient man I've ever been around. Hank Bauer turned the meeting over to our super scout at that time, Jim Russo. And Jim Russo's babbling about an hour and a half. I mean, he has found all of these little idiosyncrasies about the Dodgers, about what pitches they like in certain counts and where to play them and where not to play them and all of this stuff. So Bauer finally gets fed up. He said, that's enough of this crap. He said, let's just go kick some butt. In you know, spring training, I, I know when I came over in 68, uh, he was using an 016, which is a big bat, 35 ounces, 35 inches long. And I broke the last bat I had in spring training, so he threw me his bat. And I said, hey, Boog, I can't swing that thing. He says, choke up on it. So I choked up on it, and I never forget. I hit a home run with that bat, and I didn't give it back to him. I used it for about a third of the season. <laughs> Probably the best finisher I've ever seen. Get Jim Palmer a three-run lead in the seventh inning, and Jim didn't need to use any curveballs. Uh, hey, Jim throw that fastball and jump. I think the it final day in Memorial Stadium exhibited exactly how the players feel about their fans because we always hear about the fans love the Orioles. And on that particular day, I can remember the present day club, we were in the clubhouse as all the old players were trotting out onto the field. And the first one, Brooksy went out to third base and the cameras panned on Brooksy and then they came back up in the stands with the music playing and Maybe a minute later, Frank trotted out to right field, waving his hand. I'm getting chill bumps as I'm talking now. But, uh, you know, we in the clubhouse, modern-day Orioles were giggling because when they started showing the stands, some of the people started wiping tears, you know. And it was a continuous applause. And then as the uh, post-game show continued, one player, then another player, and then Jim Palmer went to the mound. And the camera panned him. And all this laughter that had been going on in the clubhouse, when they saw tears running down Palmer's cheek, it got dead silent in our clubhouse. And I think at that moment, the young Orioles realized what it meant to be part of the Baltimore organization. center field. Bradley to his left on the run. He dives and he makes a one. And the pitch is swung on and drilled into left field. Base hit. They are going to wave and serve off. Here comes the throw. He is out at the plate. Right fielder Robinson back. He, I don't know whether he's got it or not. I think he may have it. Popped up. Shallow center could be trouble. They'll risk it with a dive and he makes an incredible pitch. Here comes the pitch. Sorrento takes the first right and the Orioles are in the wind column opening. 
Paul Richards had the face of an Old West cowboy and the tactical mind of a Roman field general. But he had the pedigree of a Baltimore Oriole. You fellas covering first base, running up that line about 10 feet, you know there's a few guys going to beat you there. You can't spot them that much and beat them at the first base. Without Paul, yeah, I don't think we, here, we certainly wouldn't have uh, reached respectability and then contention as quickly as we did. If Baltimore was to find the path, he would guide the way, and he wasted no time. If we have a chance to make deals that will help our ball club, certainly we cannot uh, stay with the same ball club that has lost 200 ball games in two years. He meant what he said. With all the savvy of a riverboat gambler, he wrangled a 17-player deal with the Yankees. The key guys in the ball of the trade were Billy Hunter, Don Larson, and myself that went to New York. And the key ones coming back were Gus Trianis and Gene Woodling and Willie Miranda that came off the Yankees to come over here. But there were a lot of fringe ball players that contributed to both clubs over that period of time. More important, the deal put the world on notice. The Orioles were no longer the St. Louis Browns. Richard's philosophy always stayed the same. The way to win in baseball, he believed, was by excellent pitching and defense. Paul was the way. manager at the time of the, of the uh, parent club here in Baltimore, and uh, he was just a great baseball man. Uh, I know when uh, I took over the ball club, I, had, I used a lot of Paul Richard's theories and work habits and uh, pitching philosophies. It became the cornerstone upon which the franchise was built. Well, I thought that Paul was a god. I mean, he uh, absolutely uh, knew the game of baseball better than anyone I've ever met in my lifetime. Uh, he knew every position. He knew what made every position tick. Uh, he just knew more baseball than any manager or any, anyone I've ever met in the game of baseball. It was cold. It was about 35 degrees in Bradenton, Florida. And Paul Richards and Lumen Harris drove their car out on the field, almost parallel to the first base coaching box, so they wouldn't have to sit up in the stands and watch the game. And they sat right there the whole game with the car pulled halfway out on the field with the heater running, sitting in there smoking and stuff. I don't know, maybe they had a couple cocktails in there too. But they were really enjoying the baseball game that day. And uh, that's probably my most, most vivid memory of tall ball. Atta boy, keep your hand up and keep your head up a little bit. As the 1950s wore on, the birds made steady progress. 1958 was a significant year. Gus Triando smacked 30 homers, tying a record for catchers. Hoyt Wilhelm, the old knuckleballer, perplexed who else but the Yankees with a 1-0 no-hitter, the first no-hitter in modern Orioles history. And of course, the big event was Baltimore's hosting of the All-Star game. The brightest star was none other than Billy O'Dell. The Birds left-hander pitched three scoreless innings, earned the save, and was named most valuable player as the American League defeated the Nationals 4-3 in a come-from-behind victory. The Orioles closed out the 50s with two 15-game winners, Wilhelm and Milt Pappas. The 50s will forever be remembered as the decade the Birds came home. Next, they would come of age. In 1960, the Orioles finished in second place with 89 victories. In 61, they were led by a hulking first baseman named Diamond Jim Gentile. He smashed 46 homers and 141 RBIs. The Orioles were now baseball's hardest charging organization. By 1964, the O's led the league almost the entire season. They relinquished the top spot only two days before the year's end, victims of untimely injuries. Nevertheless, Brooks Robinson was the American League's most valuable player. 19-year-old Wally Bunker won 19 games, and manager Hank Bauer's bulldog visage scowled at the nation. Baltimore's boys of summer knew how to play the game. Now they were clearly on the threshold. In the trade that rocked the baseball world, Cincinnati divorced the former National League MVP on the grounds that he was an old 30. Buttoning up his Orioles jersey to start the 1966 season, he was an angry number 20. Bauer said, hey, go on up and take a swing. Well, Frank's right off the airplane. He didn't much care about it. Wait a little while, you know, and he'd take his BP and get everything going. And, and it, you know, it didn't mean a thing. It was just a pickup game going on. And uh, finally, Bauer said, hey, go on up and take a hack, you know. So 
Frank against his better judgment. But what the heck, it's his first day with a ball club, and he, want, he, he's, he wants the guys to know that he's as, you know, as regular as anybody else, so he did. He walked up there and ripped a line drive double into the left field corner, right off the airplane. I thought to myself, maybe we've got something special here, and we did. I turned to somebody and I said, I think we just won the pennant, mainly because I thought Frank would make that kind of difference on our ball club and 49 home runs, he did. Frank Robinson came over here in 1966 and won the Triple Crown, which no one had done in years and years and years. Not only that, but as Brooks Robinson often said, uh, we had a good ball club. Uh, Frank taught us how to win. Robbie wasted no time. In the first three games of 1966, he homered. He knew how to go get the ball, too. He was a manager on the field he was the judge, he was the police officer, he was the principal out there. When you didn't do things right, when you did not play and give your best, when you made boneheaded plays, Weaver did not have to say anything because Frank was there to let you know. Frank stood right up there on the top of the plate, knew he was going to get hit a lot, did get hit a lot, took it, went to first base. but. Uh, uh, the, he, he, got, he got a lot of them back, <laughs> you know, and uh, by home runs and, and a lot of other things. So uh, Frank was just a, a, a tough guy. I mean, he, he, he always had that reputation. When he came over here, that's, that's just the way he played. So that was a real plus for the Orioles. I was shocked, hurt, upset, and stunned. I just didn't understand why the trade was made. But after I thought about it for a couple of days, I said maybe the best thing for me in my career to get a fresh start in a new city, a new team. Baltimore had been close a couple of years in a row. And I said, if I can go over here and do what I'm capable of doing, help the team, maybe we can get over the top. At season's end, Robinson was the American League's most valuable player. His anger had wrought 49 home runs, 122 runs batted in, and a 316 batting average. Not bad for an old man of 31. It seemed there was nothing Frank Robinson couldn't do on the field or even in the clubhouse. A kangaroo court is something that, uh, of course, Frank Robinson was the judge of the kangaroo court, and uh, any cases that came up, we uh, made quite a lot of money that we donated to charity. Uh, I know at one time Earl Weaver might put a runner in to pinch run if he, uh, to steal a base. If he got thrown out, Earl Weaver got fined for making a bad move, that kind of thing. We impeached Frank one time. Uh, he was, of course, the judge, and, and the judge never got fined. So he was really uh, laying heavy fines on all of us throughout the year. So we impeached him for one day, and I think we got him for about three or $400 in one day. The whole court was just Frank Robinson Day. We got back with him. <laughs> Boog's going to celebrate a birthday up in Seattle, and uh, we're going to be at such and such a hotel. If you feel like sending him a card or a wire or something like that, you know, feel free. Wish him a happy birthday. Didn't make any difference. You know, it didn't seem like it was a terrible thing to do. We got fined by the kangaroo court for contributing to the downfall of the, and the physical condition of an athlete because every time the phone rang would be another message that they wanted to know if they could bring it up to Boog and we were interrupting his sleep. What I was trying to do is try to help my teammates be the best players they possibly could be because the managers sometimes don't have the time to stop a player and talk to him about some little mistake. But what a little mistake can do is become a big mistake and the big mistake is going to cost you ball games. And down the road, you don't want to lose ball games. You, you should win. Winning the pennant by nine games, the Orioles were still a long way from ultimate victory. Standing between them and the world championship were Sandy Koufax, Don Drysdale, and the Los Angeles Dodgers. The geniuses who predict such things gave the young birds scant chance against the defending champions. Perhaps they didn't consider the damage a single surname could deliver. The Robinsons belted back-to-back -back homers in the first inning of game one. The O's went on to a 5-2 victory. The next day, precocious Jim Palmer, just shy of his 21st birthday, engaged one of the greatest pitchers who ever lived. The looping right-hander handled Sandy Koufax and the Dodgers 6-0 to become the youngest hurler ever to throw a World Series shutout. In fact, after game one, the Dodgers never touched home plate again. When the series traveled to Baltimore, Wally Bunker and Dave McNally followed the path that Palmer blazed, also shutting out the worn-out Los Angeles. Frank Robinson smacked another homer in game four and added World Series MVP to his resume. After 12 years back in the big leagues, the Baltimore Orioles were world champions. 
when Blair caught the ball in center field, or the, the championship was ours. Well, I just took off for uh, McNally, you know, and jumped up in the air. And to this day, my kids that still think that was trick photography, you know, they said, you never jumped that high in your life. Came back uh, on a bus coming to back to the stadium. There was a big sign out on 33rd Street that said, would you believe four straight? And we all kind of giggled and laughed at it. So I felt like we could beat them in the series. I didn't have any idea about four straight, naturally. But I felt like we had as good a ball club as they had, if not better, and we could, uh, we could beat them. Frank's presence helped everybody out. I mean, it helped Brooks a lot, and it helped me a lot. It, it took a lot of the pressure off of me, knowing that I had to hit a home run every time up. And, uh, you know, Frank was up there, and uh, I was hitting behind Frank a lot, and then Frank would hit behind me in certain situations. And uh, it, was a, it was a real treat hitting around Frank, you know, because everybody knew you just, you couldn't walk anybody to get to Frank because he was going to take you deep. So I was just sitting all over stuff, man. It was all over fastballs right there. That was the great part of it. I'll never forget going back to the hotel on the bus uh, after the first game. Not too many guys on the bus, but among them was Dave Johnson and Luis Aparicio. And uh, they kept talking about celebrities that the players had seen behind the dugout, movie stars and things of that sort. And, and somebody mentioned Frank Sinatra was there. And uh, Davey Johnson said, where was he? And they said he was sitting in the second row of the, of, of the uh, right behind our dugout. You didn't see him? He said, no, I didn't see him. Luis Aparicio spoke up and he said, hey, you know C. Sinatra, how are you going to see that Koufax curveball? The records of baseball will indicate that Dave Johnson got the last hit that Sandy Koufax ever gave up. Strange. In mid-season 1968, Hank Bauer, unable to meet raised expectations, was replaced by Earl Weaver. Not exactly possessed of what you'd call a charming disposition, Weaver, however, was a winner. Of course, he had some help along victory's path by the likes of Boog Powell and Mike Cuellar. Powell, a 230-pound first baseman, had a voracious appetite for home runs. He gobbled up 37 fat pitches and knocked 127 little black and orange birds over home plate in 69. Crazy Horse, the newest addition to the pitching stable, drove opponents crazy with his screwball and won 23 games. The ball club won a staggering 109. The birds would meet the amazing New York Mets. In game one, all went according to plan. Cuellar defeated Tom Seaver 4-1. After that, to the astonishment of an entire nation, the Mets battled back. Jerry Kuzman, Seaver, and a young fastballer named Nolan Ryan led a team that had curried the favor of the baseball guy. The next four in a row were snatched from the stunned birds. 1970 was a season of atonement. Boog Powell was the worst torture of all. He punished pitchers with 35 home runs and 114 RBIs. He ran away with MVP honors. Incredible was the only way to describe it, and more incredible still, that virtually the entire season of grand accomplishment was obscured by one player and five October days. Brooks has to be the best that ever I've ever seen at his position. And the one thing about that, it wasn't God-given uh, ability. And in the 70s series, they, you know, everybody was oh and awed about the plays that he made uh, defensively. And me, as a spectator, I'm saying, well, what's the big deal? I see him do it all, all year long. He makes those plays. It's no big deal. I know Brooks used to take a thousand ground balls every day, and some of the plays that I saw him make in games, I know I saw him practicing those same kind of plays. And playing left field, I remember one time I told him, I said, Brooks, I'm watching you. If you if you miss the ball, I'll kill you because I'm just watching you, not backing you up. To a generation who never saw him play, Brooks Robinson is an enigma. He has no peer in today's game, no one with whom to compare. Brooks discarded the laws of gravity and showed the world moves they never dreamed existed. Today, he remains a symbol of sublime perfection, a prototype, the very essence of third base. To be sure, Baltimoreans worshipped him. But on the biggest stage of all, the World Series, he snared the spotlight like a wicked line drive and dominated the series as no one else ever had. Defense we don't even have to talk about again because he was just great as far as a defensive third baseman. But Brooks made himself a hitter. Brooks was not a power hitter, and he worked at pulling the ball and hitting a few out of the ballpark. 
he was, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best, if not the best again, at getting a run in in the seventh, eighth, and ninth inning with two outs and a man in scoring position. I mean, he must have hit 800. Here we were winning all these gold gloves, and poor Boog never won, uh, won, never won a gold glove. Took a lot of abuse, but I tell you, he was an outstanding first baseman. I mean, good hands, got, you know, moved around a lot better than anyone thought he did. Great target to throw to, and, and he'd never let us forget that. Every time that uh, I'd make a low throw, I, I'd swear he'd go somewhere and, and mark it down, you know. And after the season, he said, okay. You're going to win another gold glove, but I saved you 15 arrows. There was 15 low throws that I dug out, you know, so he let every, he, he kept us all on our toes, you know, and every bad throw we gave him, well, he kept, he kept a little book, I think, of uh, how many bad throws that all the infielders threw to him. Success in 1971 started with four words, Cuellar, McNally, Palmer, and Dobson. The Orioles were armed and dangerous with a rotation that featured four 20-game winners. But not to be outdone, O's batsmen were equally dangerous. Frank, Brooks, and Boog led the Bird Blitzkrieg through the American League. The heavily favored Orioles lived up to their billing in the first two World Series games, and it seemed that the romp was afoot. But they weren't counting on the resiliency of one tough pirate, Roberto Clemente. The times were changing. The birds were no longer the force that once seemed capable of moving heaven and earth. But pitching and defense sustained a team still able to provide more than its share of thrills. And that was quite apparent in 1974. Eight games out, as late as August 29th, a 10-game winning streak changed the race completely. A hard day's work on Labor Day provided the climax, a pair of one nothing shutouts over Boston. The O's had come back and won the East, only to lose the playoffs and the pennant to Oakland. In August 1977, a great era came to an end. Brooks Robinson retired. He was the cornerstone upon which a great dynasty was built. And when he left, he did so with American League, All-Star Game, and World Series MVP honors. Just about every record in the book for fielding excellence and 16 gold gloves in his treasure chest. But the game stops for no one. What kept the club truly competitive in these years were two men who shared nothing in common, except winning. One was tall and lean, the other short and stout. One was eloquent, the other earthy. One was Cy Young, the other see you later. No wonder they got along so well. Baseball players are together more during the summer a baseball team, then each individual would be with their wives. And when you're together that much, there's going to be some arguments. Jimmy and I had some dandies. If I was going to describe Earl Weaver to somebody that never seen him, obviously he was a short guy. He was like 5'6", which is why we never saw eye to eye. About when to take him out, when to leave him in. You know, he looked at himself as being a very positive guy, but there was nobody more negative ever that, that managed who the umpire might be that night and how we're going to handle the umpire. I mean, one day I, I walk a couple guys in the first inning, Blanchard makes two errors, which didn't happen very often in the same inning. Boog loses the ball in the sun and they get two runs and during the middle of the first inning against the Twins in Baltimore, he, he walks out to the mound and asks me if I'm trying. And I go, am I trying? I said, you made out the lineup. I said, why don't you go ask, you know, Belanger over at Troy, walk out there now, or I'll go out there, ask him if he's trying, because you put his name in the lineup and he's made two errors. I said, or better yet, why don't you go act, you know, ask the heavyweight over at first, you know, if, if, you know, if he meant to lose that pop fly in the sun. I said, he may squash you. After we had clinched the division, I told Palmer he was starting the first game, and Palmer said, I'm not starting the first game. And I said, you're starting the first game, Jeff. He said, no, Flanagan deserves to start the first game. Flanagan's going to be the Cy Young Award winner, and he won more games than me. And I said, Jim, you've had the experience. You've been through it. You know what you're doing. You know the hitter's inside out. You're starting the first game. Well, it caused a feud. The great thing about playing for Earl Weaver is that when you knew you were going to spring training, first of all, he's going to take the, uh, the best 25 players. He wasn't going to have Harry Dalton or Frank Cashin or Hank Peters tell him who were the best 25 guys. I mean, Earl was going to fight for the roster he wanted, and he had the kind of power, even though he had a lot of one-year contracts, to do that because he could be argumentative. 
And number two, you knew that you had a chance to win. So I would have liked to have been close to a lot of the ball players, and especially Jim Palmer, because Jim is one of the cleanest livers you'll ever see and one of the most intelligent people to talk to. I never would have gotten the work into the Hall of Fame without him. At times, it made it very difficult. But, uh, you know, looking back, gave me every opportunity to go out there and win a lot of games and lose a lot of games. Uh, he had a very simple philosophy. In most years, till late in my career, he didn't think there was anybody better in the bullpen. So why bring anybody in? I guess uh, there were a lot of them that, uh, you know, don't even come to mind anymore. Important at the time, probably, to one of us. Probably never important to both of us. Because one of us might have been laughing at the other guy all the time in, in some of these arguments. Their stormy relationship had its ups and downs. But no two men were more instrumental to the Orioles' sustained success than Jim Palmer and Earl Weaver. Palmer's slow, graceful pitching motion seemed an exaggerated thing of beauty until it climaxed into the exploding high fastball, hard to lay off, impossible to hit. Despite career-threatening injuries, he won 20 or more games eight times and the Cy Young Award three times. In the best season of his career, 1975, he won 23 games with a paltry 2.09 earned run average. You ever see Earl when he gets out there and puts his hands back this way? Then you know he's got something he wants to say. Finally, the home plate umpire came out to the mound. And Earl turned to the umpire and he said, look, he said, this man has won 20 games in a year, eight years. He said, where do you want him to throw it to get a strike? You're gone. If Palmer couldn't get along with his manager, he certainly had less to gripe about than the American League's umpires. The O's skipper was a cantankerous, obsessed genius with a hair-trigger temper, and nothing set it off like an umpire's mistake. Until something happened in a ball game, you know, you're the calmest person in the world. Well, you're on edge in a one-to-one -one ball game, but, you know, an umpire hasn't been part of it. I'm on edge because I want my pitcher to throw a strike. But in that one-to-one -one ball game, and a guy slides into second base, that uh, opponent slides into second base that I think I'm out, and my shortstop jumps up, boy, there it is. There's a ball game out there. I got pitches that uh, other catchers didn't get. Um, not because of me, but because of Earl. Uh, because they reached a certain point in the game when they did not want to hear Earl's voice. He had a couple run-ins with the umpire. And finally he went out to the mound, you know, and he was talking about something to do with in the rule book. And, and the umpire saying, well, he said, I'm right, you know, and Earl. So, oh, he ran into the, he ran into the, uh, into the clubhouse, you know, and then he came back and he had the rule book. And out on the mound, that's when he tore the rule book right up on the mound, you know, and said, we're not going to play by the rules. We don't need this rule book. Just kind of threw it up, on the, uh, up on, the, on the pitcher's mound. But as fiery as Weaver was, he could also be cool and calculating. Keeping meticulous files, he was ever aware of his batsman's performances against each enemy pitcher. When the game was on the line, he was at his best. No matter who was pitching, he always knew where to turn. Since Earl did want to use everybody on the ball club, and he had no favorites, believe me, he had no favorites, but he wanted to use everybody that was a member of that ball club, that we should go out and try to have the very best bench that we could possibly acquire. Because if Earl was going to use them, I wanted to make certain that we didn't weaken ourselves when he made a move. And it was as a result of that that uh, we, I think that we finally put together what Earl referred to as deep depth. Earl was very astute in that sense and, and he, he knew the game so well and he knew his players so well that he would use certain players in certain situations and I guarantee you those players do uh, deliver it in that situation. When one guy gets hurt and you can replace him with somebody else just as good, a guy that's sitting on the bench waiting for his chance, you know, to get into the regular lineup. Uh, that's, that's what you call deep depth, and that's when you got a good ball club, when you can use all 25, and all 25 of them can come through for you one time, one time or two during the course of the season. Weaver led the team from the late 1960s until the early 1980s, from the Frank and Brooks powerhouses to the Lowenstein and Renneke underdogs. In all of that time, one thing never changed, winning. In 1976, Hank Peters unleashed a deal that would mold the Orioles for years to come. Reminiscent of Paul Richards' legendary swap, he traded Ken Holtzman, Doyle Alexander, Grant Jackson, Elrod Hendricks, and Jimmy Freeman to the Yankees. The Orioles picked up two of their all-time greatest left-handers, starter Scott McGregor and relief ace Tippy Martinez, a strong-arm catcher named Rick Dempsey, and also Rudy May and Dave Pagan. Things were growing on the farm, too. 
Most prominent among them was a laconic first baseman who would ultimately become the most prolific switch hitter with power since Mickey Mantle. For pitchers of the late 1970s and 80s, there was no more menacing sight on the entire planet than that of Eddie Murray stepping into the batter's box late in a game. Bursting onto the scene as a 21-year-old rookie phenom in 1977, he was a man of few words. His bat, on the other hand, spoke volumes. The taciturn first baseman could turn on a pitch and turn on a crowd. From left side or right, he was equally devastated. If I find anybody in baseball, you pick anybody in the game of baseball. If my life was on the line and there was a game-winning RBI out there in the ninth inning, Eddie Murray would be my guy. I know he would get him in. That's how, that's how confident that I am in Eddie Murray, even to this day. He learned to switch it in double A, which I thought was incredible. I never thought he'd have a chance. I've never seen anybody do it, just to kind of say, I'm going to switch it and do it with power. The first game he ever did it was in double A ball in Birmingham, Alabama, and they had a huge left field wall. And his first time up, he hit one of the better pitchers in the league over the left field wall. So I said, he's going to be all right. And he was, he was special. Eddie Murray, uh by far the best switch hitter that I've ever seen. Uh, somehow or other, when you think about switch hitters, you, you really don't think about power hitters. You know, guys that are able to hit from the either side of the plate, sometimes are, are hitters that ping the ball around and, and just, you know, do it that way. I don't think, I, I can't think of a better uh, switch hitter, a fellow who had more power than Eddie Murray. Teamed with fellow switch hitter Ken Singleton, the Orioles had one of the most difficult 3-4 combinations in the game. Murray was at his best when all the chips were on the line. The numbers he has put up there, I mean, he's not going to be a marginal Hall of Famer. He's, gonna, you know, he's, he's had a uh, long, illustrious career. I mean, broke Mickey Mantle's, uh, uh, you know, record for home runs from both sides of the plate in, in a game with 11. Uh, he's putting up numbers uh, that are going to make him be one of the, the, the greatest players that ever played this game. In addition to his incredible and well-documented accomplishments at the plate, he was a spectacular fielder, winning three straight Gold Glove Awards. Eddie was a good defensive ball player, and uh, Eddie was a smart ball player. Uh, Eddie didn't waste any steps now. I mean, there was no false hustle in Eddie, and he didn't do it for the crowd or, or anybody else. He did it for his teammates. When Eddie put it on, uh, he did it hard. Led by Murray in the batter's box and lefty Mike Flanagan on the mound, the Orioles were again ready to make a run for the flag in 1979. But this was no typical Oriole team. Where Boog, Brooks, and Frank once roamed, there were now Garcia and Renneke, Lowenstein, Bumbry, and Dempsey. In 1979, the O's won with more than just talent. They made it with magic. Doug DeSensei was the first to discover it. Soon, late-inning heroics became the norm. In a June to remember, the Orioles were an incredible 23-6. and six. Eleven of those victories were come from behind thrillers, and every night, it was a different hero. Flanagan led a great pitching staff with 23 victories and a Cy Young Award. Kenny Singleton smashed 35 homers from both sides of the plate, and the fans got into the act like never before. Turning out in record numbers, they were driven to near frenzy levels by a rotund cab driver from Dundalk, Wild Bill Hagee, encouraged bird bats with a roar from 34. Winners of 102 games, the O's waylaid the Angels in the playoffs, and then prepared for Pittsburgh. Known as the family, the Pirates were treated like in-laws by the Orioles in game one. The O's jumped out to a 3-1 series lead, but like Clemente before, Willie Stargell led the Bucks back. And then in game seven, heartbreak. Baltimore honored its team anyway for its tremendous and unexpected season. Another significant event in 1979 was the purchase of the ball club by Washington attorney Edward Bennett Williams from the brewing magnet Gerald C. Hotberg. In 1980, Steve Stone, a journeyman free agent acquisition, had the finest single season in the history of the Major League's finest pitching franchise. In 1982, two legends shared just a single season. Weaver announced his intentions to retire at the end of the year, 
while rookie third baseman Cal Ripken Jr. with this swipe of his bat opening day announced his intentions to stay. Ripken seemed the natural, but Weaver saw something different, a shortstop. The experts scoffed. His father would bring him out to the ballpark at 14, 15 years old, and I'd hit him ground balls myself and was amazed at his ability to get to the ball and the great arm that he had. Baltimore wanted to sign him as a pitcher. If I executed this pitch and it was hit the shortstop, it wasn't out. I mean, there was no question that he was going to catch it and throw it accurately. And I mean, I would actually try to have my game plan so the ball would be hit in his direction. I mean, I trusted him the most. He is such a valuable part of our ball club, whether it's hitting, fielding, or just sharing his knowledge of the game with the other players. En route to winning Rookie of the Year honors, he teamed with Eddie Murray and 15-game winner Jim Palmer to help the Orioles to another miracle finish. The O's were four games behind with four games to play. They had to win them all. The essence of a classic pennant confrontation, each game crackled with the intensity of sudden death. Only on the last day, the birds succumbed. The fans, exhausted and overwhelmed, stayed even in defeat. I couldn't believe that the fans were cheering, cheering for myself and for the ball players, and it's something that you'll never regret. It brought tears to my eyes, and uh, half of it was for not winning for the people of Baltimore, for winning for my players, winning for myself, not going into the playoffs, but uh, it was uplifting, you know. I'd have, if without that ovation, I certainly would have felt a heck of a lot worse. Under new manager Joe Altabelli, no one quite knew what to expect in 1983. Cal and Eddie led the attack and finished first and second respectively in the league MVP voting. 1983 was Scott McGregor's turn to be the ace, leading the club with 18 victories. Once again, the Orioles saved the best for last, scorching the American League with a torrid 34 and 10 finish. The series seemed a difficult challenge. The National League champion Philadelphia Phillies featured Pete Rose, Mike Schmidt, and Steve Carlton. It was a tough ball club and defeated the O's in game one. But the Orioles came back to sweep the next four in a row, including a bittersweet game three. It featured Jim Palmer in a performance of fateful symmetry. He defeated the Phillies' brilliant left-hander and future Hall of Famer Steve Carlton. Early the next season, Palmer would retire. Rick Dempsey was the ultimate hero. Long a Baltimore favorite, he was admired as much for his blue-collar ethic as his irreverent and unpredictable humor. Dempsey batted 385 with five extra base hits and was named the series MVP. Owner Edward Bennett Williams was never more proud. Like Palmer, Williams' last great triumph was the 83 series. In the years following 83, he desperately sought the winning combination. But the Oriole farm system, the team's secret weapon for so many years, was finally depleted. Williams grasped for immediate solutions, including a shopping spree in the free agent market, but to no avail. Williams assembled a management team consisting of Roland Heeman, Doug Melvin, and Oriole great Frank Robinson to work in concert under his protege, Larry Lucchino. This was the traditional Oriole way, and they turned the tide in a swift, bold stroke in 89. In just one year after hitting rock bottom, the Birds were serious pennant contenders again. Sadly, Williams did not live to see it. The team that had just a year earlier come completely unglued, that had lost 107 games, was now the most improbable pennant contender in the major leagues. By the last series of the season, the Birds were flying neck and neck with the Toronto Blue Jays. In a thrilling climax at the Sky Dome, the O's fell just short. We weren't supposed to do much. People didn't expect anything. But what I got from that ball club was a total team effort. We worked very hard in spring training from day one until the spring training was over on fundamentals. The more success they had, the more they wanted to do it. And it just became contagious. The fact that nobody ran away from us allowed us to kind of hang in there a little longer, and, and it helped with our confidence. And, it just seemed like everything went right. We played well as a team. We had, we had a hero every night. Uh, the momentum carried us uh, as a team through some slow periods. Um, it was just a year of overachievement. The team was on the upswing, but time was growing short for Memorial Stadium. 
The grand ballpark, heralded as one of the finest in 1954, had become old and outdated. Fittingly, Mike Flanagan closed the door on the historic old home. I ended up striking out the two hitters that I faced to, to end it, and then going down into the, the tunnel, and it was like I was walking by. The, it, it appeared they had them lined up almost like year to year. I mean, you know, Brooks and Frank and Jim and Dave Skaggs and all these people I hadn't seen. They were lined up all the way back to the clubhouse and to having to almost to pass them. I had to go in and change to come back out. But the fuck you were going back in time. You know, I, and I, I just can't describe what that, that moment felt. Almost like I got the approval of the generations you did okay for us. It was very, I guess, gratifying. It was. It was exciting, it was uh, sad, uh, it was all the emotions. You run the entire gamut of emotions in that thing because you know that's the last major league game that's going to be played in that ballpark. Uh, it, it, you had a lot of fun times there, you had a lot of disappointment, a lot of sad time, and you just hated to see it go. A heart-tearing, wonderfully warm, great experience. and. Uh... When I walked out of the ballpark after we were finished and I walked by people who were openly crying and it was difficult, difficult to handle. But if you were there or anybody who has seen the film or the, the, the TV replay would have to recognize what it was just one of the most magnificent moments in the history of baseball as I know it. It was tremendous. Every day, despite the aches, the pains, the fatigue, and the stress, he shows up for the job. Every game, every season, for more than a decade. In the process, he's come close to grabbing an iron horse by the tail. Cal Ripken is one of a kind. Uh, a dedicated player, uh, tremendous courage, uh, can play with injuries. Certainly, you don't go through a streak from 1982 until now without having many aches and pains that could often keep players out of a lineup. He's the epitome of what you would like a player to be. He sits in on our, our pitchers meetings before we go over each club. You know, the first game in the series, uh, we'll go over each club and all their hitters. And like I said, Cal has seen, you know, he's out there every day and he's seen so many of the hitters. He knows what pitches they can really hit and what they can hit. And uh, he's really a big part of, of how we pitch guys. I mean, uh, you, can, you can see how he positions himself and how well he plays out there that he knows each hitter and where they're going to hit the ball. So. Uh, uh, you know, you got to give him credit. He, he's been around, he's learned a lot, and uh, he's been a huge help for the young guys. I mean, whenever I have a problem, I don't necessarily go talk to another pitcher or, or talk to the pitching coach. I may go talk to Cal and say, hey, you know, in this situation, uh, did I throw the wrong pitch, you think, or, or did I do something wrong right here? And, and he's always got something positive to say. Well, the streak is uh, the most amazing thing that uh, I've ever seen here in Oriole history, almost. I mean, how can anyone play over 2,000 games in a row? It's just almost impossible. And, a number of times you come to the ballpark and you don't feel well, maybe, but you still go out there and play. And there's no doubt that he's had some injuries, minor injuries, that have slowed, his, slowed him down some, uh, hindered his performance, but not enough to really uh, hurt the team. And, uh, you know, God willing, uh, he's going to break Lou Gehrig's record. And that's just uh, something that uh, no one ever fathomed that could, could happen. In a special issue, Sports Illustrated named him the best shortstop in baseball history. Whether leather or lumber, the numbers back it up. With this homer in 1993, he surpassed Ernie Banks to become the greatest power-hitting shortstop of all time. But shortstop has traditionally been a defensive position, and the best have been judged on the strength of their glove work. In 1990, Ripken had a 996 fielding percentage, the highest ever by a shortstop. He committed just three errors the entire season. He now holds more than 10 records for Major League shortstops. He's been Rookie of the Year, MVP of the All-Star Game, and Most Valuable Player of the American League twice. 
He's won two gold gloves. He's an asset to the ball club, uh, both offensively and defensively. Now, when a player goes into a slump, uh, we'll say a first baseman, uh, left fielder, right fielder, that's not doing the job defensively, uh, yeah, you can afford to take him out. But if you take out Cal Ripken and that ball's hit to a shortstop in the ninth inning, you want Cal Ripken out there to field it and make uh, get that sure out for you. In 1992, the Orioles moved to a special new home. Oriole Park at Camden Yards pays tribute to all that is beautiful in the classic American ballpark. It's also the place where baseball's largest legend grew from a misunderstood youth swinging his fists to the greatest player who ever swung a bat. There's simply no more hallowed or worthy address for baseball in all of America than 333 West Camden Street. That fact became clear to the entire world in 1993 when Baltimore again hosted the All-Star Game. The day before the game, a couple of old Orioles showed they still had the right stuff. The game itself, as in 58, went to the American League. Later in the year, fans had another reason to be euphoric. The most treasured local institution was again in the hands of local ownership. Peter Angelos, a Baltimorean, led a group that was not to be denied. In the 90s, many Oriole traditions continue. The team is still a perennial pennant contender on the strength of Paul Richards' vision. Great pitching, solid fielding, and powerful slugging. As the 40th season unfolds, much is new. But if the Baltimore Orioles teach anything at all, it's that the things we value most are the feelings that never change. There's a place you can always go when the sun literally splashes down upon you, where your heart leaps at that first glimpse of green. And out on that lawn are the men. Time changes their faces and names, but their youth and triumph are eternal in the crowd's adoration. Go catch, throw hard and true, leap without regret, swipe that ball. From 33rd Street to West Camden Street, one season fades into another. But the game, Baltimore's game, lives on forever. Here are some other videos available from Orioles Productions. First, travel down 33rd Street to Memorial Stadium, where we gathered a lifetime of memories. It is going to be the 500th home run. Here's a fly ball and a deep right, Get out of here! Get out of here! Go on! He reaches up and he makes the catch, and then slams into the wall, and then hangs on to it. From the year the Orioles returned to Baltimore to the final emotion-filled weekend in 1991, relive a collection of wonderful Orioles moments we call Miracles on 33rd Street. What was it like to be there in those final days at Memorial Stadium? See those dramatic final moments on the field and the behind the scenes action that led up to them in the final weekend. Then complete the trilogy with Welcome Home, the story of the inaugural season of Oriole Park at Camden Yards. We're getting ready, waiting for you. Yeah, we're ready to say hello. One by one, you come for fun. Smile by smile, come stay a while. Welcome home, come on in. Yeah, we're here to say hello. Welcome home. You're gonna have a great time.
time. Welcome Any day or night time. Welcome Gonna have a great time. See you at the park. Watch all the excitement of the opening of the best ballpark in baseball and the surprising and inspiring season that followed. And now the newest selection from the Orioles Productions Video Library to add to your collection. When the Orioles got off to a rocky start to begin the 1993 season, the Orioles faithful were justifiably concerned. Now they've got two men at third base. Does anybody know what's going on out there? But the birds rallied behind the bat of Chris Hoyles, the glove of Mark McLemore, the guts of Cal Ripken and Harold Baines, and an array of key contributors. A pennant race filled Oriole Park all summer long. And so did a record number of devoted Orioles fans. And in the middle of it all, baseball's best came to play in baseball's best park. And the city and state put their best foot forward for an unprecedented week-long celebration known as All-Star Week. Enjoy these memories from the presidential first pitch to the now famous All-Star Home Run Derby in the home video release of 1993, an All-Star season. To order these and other Orioles Productions videos, call 1-800-428-2101. That's 1-800-428-2101.